This is Freedom Investor Radio, and I'm John Pearl. It hit me like a freight train when I realized there was a better way. When I discovered that I could take my future into my own hands. When I realized I could invest my way to freedom. This is what I'm working towards. In each episode of Freedom Investor Radio, we will explore the tactics and strategies used by the top real estate investors and entrepreneurs in the nation. We will learn how you can start investing your way to freedom and take control of your life. Thanks so much for tuning in. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Freedom Investor Radio. I'm your host, John Pearl. And today I am joined by Freedom Investor's own Daniel Genter. We're doing something a little bit different today. We're doing this in the format of a live virtual fireside chat meetup, whatever you want to call it. But today we want to highlight Daniel. I think he's got a very impressive real estate investing journey, and I think it will be very beneficial to those who are either working full time and looking to get into real estate investing or already have started real estate investing, looking to hear another perspective. So Daniel, thanks for joining me today. I'm going to, let's just get right into it. So for those of you that for those that don't know you, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and why you started investing in real estate in the first place? Sure. Thank you, John. Happy to be here. So I'm Daniel. I'm a tech professional, right? I took a very traditional route, went to college, went to graduate school, got a business degree and entered this exciting area of in the technology industry. And although I love my job and because I am still a tech professional, I have a W-2 job. Although I love my job, what I found once I entered my post-graduate school career, kind of started this new thing in the tech space, was that it didn't fulfill all of my professional passions. And it left me a little unfulfilled on the personal side as well, when I thought about how it impacted my financial well-being and the financial future of my family. And so the reason I got into real estate is that a couple of years into this new tech career, I just happened to hear a colleague talk about a, a house hack that he had one day telling his college, telling us at the office about how he turned his single family home into a split rental and just renting out a room in, at his house. And I thought, hey, that sounds interesting. Long story short, like I spent many months reading books, listening to podcasts, doing the thing many of us do. And I ended up buying my first single family home. And again, the reason for it was just didn't feel completely satisfied in my professional life, wanted to do something outside of work that kind of fulfilled me in that way. And then I also wanted to prepare for my family's future financially and have something that I could put time into, make it my own, and maybe make some income on the side. Long story short, that's how I got into real estate. Got it. And what was the process like deciding where you were going to invest, what type of property you were going to purchase? Was it a pretty quick process or was it like one of those things where you did a ton of research on and sat and dwelled on it for a couple of years? What was that like? Yeah, it was more the latter, right? It happens to a lot of us, right? I didn't quite get to analysis paralysis you hear folks talk about, but I was well down down that path because the, your first investment, it's like a little bit scary, especially if it's a in a space that's new to you. I'm a renter, right? I live out in California. Homes are super expensive. I When I bought my first single family home, I was living in a one bedroom apartment in, the, in Silicon Valley. So to me, it was like a big investment. It was definitely the biggest investment I'd ever made in my life biggest purchase. And so I wanted to make sure I did it right. And so I looked really closely at a bunch of different markets. I was looking outside of California because the cost of homes here were so high. And where I landed was investing back in my home state of Wisconsin. And so I didn't put a lot of forethought into kind of that whole process and decision-making. I just eventually fell into it. But I think I lucked out a little bit because I ended up with a really good mentor who was also in Wisconsin, he happened to be an agent, and he helped me purchase this first property, but he was an investor himself, right? And so he showed me some of the tricks of the trade, taught me some of the lessons that he'd learned in his career, and it helped me with that first investment. So I think having someone like him who had been there before, he was like a 
he was like several steps ahead of me on his investment journey. Having someone like that, as you get started investing in real estate, it was beneficial to me and I really recommend it for others as well. Got it. So you started off, most people do investing in single family. And what happened? What got you to a point where you're thinking, I need to get to moving up to the bigger stuff. So talk about the transition from single family to multifamily, why you did it, what were the differences, things like that. Sure. Yeah. I really feel my, the first parts of my room. I just had a series of lucky coincidences because I felt kind of that way with falling into just hearing my colleague talk about his house hack rental that got me thinking about real estate in the first place. And then what got me thinking about multifamily was equally just happened chance. And it happened after I'd purchased my first two single family homes. And like I said before, I was reading books and listening to podcasts. I just heard on a podcast about this big apartment investment. And at the time, I didn't really understand how the business model worked or even that was a thing that people do. But they were talking about this big apartment complex. It was actually in Phoenix that was being purchased and they wanted to have partners work with them on this deal. Again, didn't know what that meant at the time, but as I learned more about it, what I learned was that there was a group of professionals who knew all about the apartment built, or rather who knew about apartments as like their full-time job. It's like the only thing that they did and they were really focused on the Arizona market. And so like they knew the area really well, but they didn't have all the capital that they needed to actually purchase the property. And so they were looking for folks like me who maybe had some interest in real estate to help them bring capital to the deal and actually like purchase the property. And I, again, lucked into this deal and ended up investing $50,000 as a passive investor. And that was my first foray into large multifamily deals. And I think it was actually, for me, it was a good one, again, because I'm someone who like likes to analyze, likes to get my feet wet before I jump in and being there as a passive investor and kind of understanding how it works was a good way for me to do that. Got it. So you went the passive route when it comes to multifamily prior to getting into you, some of the, your own personal larger investments, you've got a number of multifamily units out of state as well. How has the process been of acquiring and managing the I do want to get into the passive side of the house as well, but fascinates me because I know how hard you work. We're, we talk every week and I know how busy you are. So what's the process like? Talk about your portfolio of multifamily that you own personally and how that is going while you are doing working a full-time job. Sure. Here's maybe where I started like thinking more or like rather taking more control over my real estate journey. So I invested in this passive deal. And what I started to realize was the model for these big apartment deals is actually kind of like the model I was using for my single family homes. And what I mean by that is that you buy this property, you make some improvements, right? Whether it's like a capital improvement to the physical building, renovations, or maybe it's an improvement to operations where you decrease the vacancy rate, but make the building better after you purchase it. And in turn, because it's an investment, right, that increases the value of the property. This is exactly the same strategy I was using for single family. And so it just got me thinking like, hey, like I already kind of how to do this, but why don't I put my effort into purchasing a property that would give me like basically more bang for my buck? Right. If I'm going to like work hard to go find a good deal and put a lot of effort into improving it, why not do it for something that's a little bit bigger that can help me get a larger return? And where that took me was several eight to 10 unit properties, again, in, the, in my home region of the Midwest, where I was buying down market properties that needed a little bit of work, fixing them up, improving the tenant base and improving vacancy and executing that kind of business plan to force appreciation and gain some equity in the building. Great. I'm super happy for that experience. And it was the first time where I really saw like a meaningful impact in financially from my real estate efforts to both like my life today and the future, the financial future of my family. It, so that felt great, but it was actually a lot of, and with, it was something I was passionate about and I loved learning how to do everything. The experience was great, but having to manage that with a full-time job and not just like a full-time job, but one that like I also liked and wanted to like continue, not just in a role, but like as a career, right? So like I wanted to have like live in both worlds. It's become like a lot to handle just with the time and from that time and energy point of view. And anyways, that, that phase 
showed me the power of real estate, but it also showed me that at a certain point, you have to like prioritize where you put your time and energy and figure out like, what are you really passionate about and where do you want to focus your energy? Yeah. So what do you think are some things that folks, for anyone who's joining us live or anybody who listens to this, that may be in a similar situation as you, they're maybe not happy with the return they're getting from stock market or their 401k, whatever it may be. And real estate seems appealing. What are some things to consider regarding, do you go the route you went and buy your own, start accumulating your own small portfolio? Or, I mean, it's not small at this point anymore, your personal portfolio, but versus passively investing with somebody else. What are some things to think about? When I talk to folks about this kind of thing, I always say, you gotta, the first two steps are find a model and then find a mentor. And what I mean by find a model is at the highest level, you got to figure out if this is something that you're passionate about to the extent that like you want to go out and actively pursue it. If you're someone who is energized by real estate, has the time and energy to figure out which market you want to invest in or go find that deal, execute your business plan, deal with tenants, then maybe you're someone who wants to like buy a rental property yourself as like an owner operator. And if you want to do that, awesome. It's a great way to build wealth. If you don't have that passion or like maybe you do, but like you're not exactly sure how to make that model work. Maybe you have that passion, but like you don't have the time and energy because like you're super busy with life and work and stuff, then maybe your model isn't the active route, but it's more passive. And in that case, in either case, the next step is figuring out like, who is your mentor, right? If you go the active route, you can find a mentor, like an agent, like I did. If you go the passive route, you want to find somebody who's been in the space for several years, right? You want to find someone who has done some deals themselves and had some success there. You want to find someone who you just know and trust and that, that find a model, find a mentor, mentor approach is something that I recommend to everybody. Got it. You and I met as a part of a mentorship program and we, we were in the same program. We formed a, formed a group and started working together. There's a multitude of benefits that come from working in a mentorship program, but there's also the argument of taking that money because it is a lot of these mentorship programs are a significant chunk and could act as a down payment for a rental property. Thoughts on investing the money versus investing the money in yourself as a part of a mentorship program. Yeah. I think it goes back to like, where does your passion lie and what, where, what are your time and energy constraints? Right. I think like you and I have the shared passion for real estate and I don't know, like we found time in our already busy lives to pursue them at that, that mentorship route so that we could con to continue being active investors at the multifamily scale. Right. So great. We fit that model. But again, like if you're someone who, if you're someone who doesn't have the time and energy or doesn't have that passion, but you still want to plan for your family's financial future, build wealth outside of the stock market, diversify, whether it's diversify from stocks or diversify within real estate. If you're one of those people who want all those things, but just don't have the time and energy or the passion and the passive route is a great option because the choice is to me, really about time and energy and not as much about returns. You can make a lot of money as a passive investor, just like you can as an active one. So what about, say somebody does want to go the active route and I think a number of people here joining us live, at least are in California. You're in San Francisco. I'm down on the central coast in San Luis Obispo. And it's hard to make the numbers work here on the coast. So a lot of California investors are looking elsewhere. What are some specific things to think about when you are looking to purchase out, out of state investment properties? Yeah. I think the hardest thing there, like I'm of the mind where like you, you can make a deal work anywhere and it just depends on the business model. Now, California and like a couple other areas in the country, like kind of unique, but like in general, like there's deals out there. And so like you find a market that you like, but if it's out, out of your, if it's remote, then like the number, number one thing is the, and so have, having, when I look back at my experience, having my mentor agent for those first couple deals in Wisconsin, really important, right? Because he taught me a little bit. He, he taught me a lot, but the most value he added wasn't necessarily in telling me about what a cap rate was. The value was that he introduced me to his network of everyone who he works with, knows and trusts. And ha having that there where it's like kind of a solution in a box for you as a an active remote investor, that makes life a lot easier because building a team remotely, it's all 
building a team itself is all about relationships and to do that remotely is really difficult. Totally. So we've talked about the single family side. We've talked about building up your own personal portfolio. We've talked about investing passively, but you and I have worked together on a couple bigger things. Tell us a little bit more about once you, the next step that you've taken. So we've gotten into the bigger stuff on the general partnership side. What are some of the things that stand out on the active investing in the larger stuff like syndications? Oh, yeah. So I went from single family to passive investor on a big apartment deal. Then I went back to active, like owner operator of some smaller stuff. And then the next step was apartment syndications. There, I think I learned so much when we did our first active deal, both and even before that, like when I think like we looked at some deals, got really close to closing and didn't quite get there. Huge learning experience. And I think what I found is that having like good partners, just like I mentioned with single family and building a team remotely, like having good partners is so important because it takes so many individuals with really focused skill sets or knowledge bases, right? Like areas of expertise to make this a big deal, like an apartment syndication work. And you need to make sure that all the key people who you're working with are folks who are like the best in the business. And so I think like when we look back at some of the deals that we've done or got close to doing, we know who the good people are and who are the superstars and who are the ones who made the deal like harder. And like working with the superstars is really important. And so I think like over the last couple of years, as we've gained experience in that area, like we have like our all-star team now of partners who like, again, we know and trust and that, that makes such a big difference on every deal we're going to, we're going, to, we're planning to do this from now forward, because we know that we have a group of people who can make it happen. Yeah, absolutely. There's definitely been a lot of learning experiences over the past couple of years and that has shaped, shaped the direction that we're heading now. So we have... As Daniel mentioned, we almost took down a 72 unit deal in Iowa that we were going to be the lead sponsors on, but due to a number of red flags out of our control, we had to respectfully back out of the deal. So out of that process, we learned some lessons and we partnered up with some folks to take down a deal of 304 unit portfolio in Alabama. And again, through that process, we learned some things. And now our current model is that we have created a fund to help folks passively invest. And Daniel, why don't you tell us a little bit about what we're doing now with uh, the Freedom Investor Fund? Yeah. The thing I like about the fund is that the thesis behind what we're doing is that every, when it comes to the commercial real estate space, every asset type whether it's apartments, whether it's a debt product, whether it's storage or short-term rentals, right? There's all asset types in the commercial real estate space. Everyone has a different financial outcome. And depending on what you want, whether it's maximizing your growth and building equity, whether it's passive income or tax mitigation, several other options as well, no matter what your financial goals are, there's an option out there that commercial real estate can like help you achieve it. And so what we, I really like about the fund that we're putting together is that it is personalized, personalized for every investor's financial goals, right? Every investor is different, but we all want the, a mix of the same set of things. And so I think the part that I am really passionate about Freedom Investor and our fund is helping folks figure out like what that mix is. And then connecting them with passive real estate investments that can help them achieve their goals. Absolutely. So at this point, I want to, if anybody has any questions that have been on your mind that you wanted to ask, go for it. I'm going to go through a list of questions that I have that folks have, that folks have reached out to me with via email that weren't going to be able to attend. So I will go through those right now and then feel free to either, if you want to raise your hand, you can do that in the reactions or just type it in the chat and I'll get to it eventually. But the first one is, let's see, what skills helped you in both arenas of your professional life or helped you transition? Meaning, I think meaning like skills from your past or your W-2 life that have helped as a real estate investor. And are there specific skill sets that are better than others in your opinion? I think one thing I do in my tech profession as a product manager and a strategy person is I tell business stories. And so what that means is taking a complex idea or something with a lot of different parts and simplifying it to help uh, you know folks understand it easily. What that comes down to is like being able to communicate well. And the one skill set that is transferable to 
my life in the real estate space is just having clear communication. Again, right, I mentioned a moment ago, so many individuals involved in doing a commercial real estate deal, they're all coming from different professions or walks of life. We also have investors, passive investors in the equation as well. Um, being able to communicate in a way that makes sense to each one of them and to tell a clear story about what you're trying to do with your freedom investor fund or your apartment syndication, that's really important to keep everyone aligned and everyone clear on what the objectives are. And so when I look at my W-2 life and everything that I'm doing in real estate, that communication piece is one of the things that I think has served me well. Yeah, and on that note, there's so many different, like real estate investing is a team sport. There's so many different areas that need to be done, areas of the profession, areas of the business, especially when it comes to the larger stuff, when it comes to putting a syndication together, there's the person who's out hunting for deals. There's the person who's, uh, that person would also be maintaining relationships with the brokers and agents. There's the people who are better at underwriting. There's the folks who are better at capital raising. So there's really all different, all sorts of different skill sets that can add value. You, know, you just got to figure out a way to do it. So let's see, what is something you wish you would have known prior to beginning your investment journey, specifically for someone who is working full-time like you are, like you were when you started your journey? Yeah, that's a good question. I actually think about that a lot these days. I think understanding the effort it would take to maintain even like a small but scaling portfolio, like of the stuff that I own and operate myself, understanding like just the time and energy commitment that would take to make sure that it is operating efficiently and is successful. I wish somebody would have knocked me on the head and told me about that because I was so eager to grow my portfolio that like I started to scale quickly. And there was like a year or two where I bought a bunch of, bought a bunch of different properties. And now all those properties are in a different stage of maturity. We started to execute the business plan and make renovations and I thought by this point it would be like a it would be it would be a passive investment the way that you hear about. And it just isn't, right? I have property managers who manage the buildings for me. I have, I think, a decent, sometimes really good team of individuals to take care of repairs and things like that. But the decision maker is always me, right? The person who when you have a tenant who's not paying, like the property manager cares a little bit. Like, but me as the owner, like I care a lot because that rent means a lot more to me than it does my, my PM. And so like the time and energy, and in this case, sometimes like the stress is like a lot more than I expected. Um, that's one thing I wish somebody would have told me is like this idea of a rentals as a passive source of, if you're the, if you're the owner operator, it's never like truly passive. And I wish I would have understood that better. Yeah, it's definitely passive investing in syndications is really the only way that I have found in real estate to like truly achieve truly passive income. In a syndication, there's one person or multiple people dedicated full-time to the asset management piece, what you were just talking about, overseeing the property managers, overseeing the business plan. So yeah, it's you hear the term passive income thrown around a lot, but investing, like owning your own property, dealing with property managers, it's definitely not as passive as it might seem. Uh, let's see, what's one of your biggest takeaways What's a big takeaway from one of your biggest failures? Talk about a big failure that you've had and lessons learned from that failure. I think I might know where you're going with this, but <laughs> I'll just know. let you go there. I don't know. So I think you're, where you're headed is that it might be with our almost deal in Iowa. And there's actually a couple of things we could point to, but I want to bring up the communication or just like working with good people part. One more time, I won't go into it because I know we already talked about it, but that, that was a big thing. The other thing I think is I'm someone who I think like in the end, I'm like an optimist. And so I think that like in general, like things are going to work out if like we do the right things. And I felt that way with the Iowa deal. And I think at a certain point, we enough things had come up on that deal where we should have seen the writing on the wall. But maybe my optimism just told me like, hey, we're just going to keep at it and it's going to work. And so one thing that I learned from that experience is on the due diligence side, just to be meticulous and detailed as soon as possible, right? We already, we were already doing the right things in understanding the details of that property. But I think some of the things, whether it's through scheduling or other issues, like we, we did them a little bit further down the line than I would ever do again. So 
I think one of my, this actually ties back to something I'm trying to do this year. Like my motto for this year is just to have a sense of urgency with everything. And that definitely applies to the due diligence, especially on these big apartment buildings, because something small that might not be in, that your inspector might not find, or the seller might not tell you about, it can have a big impact on the deal. And we we want to find out about those as soon as possible. Absolutely. At what point does it make sense to syndicate a deal? Is there a specific size? What are the numbers looking like when it comes to syndication versus a joint venture or purchasing on your own? Number of things that go into that, but what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think there, there's a rule of thumb and this is mostly on the like the operator side rather than the passive investor side. Like as an operator, there's several like legal structuring and other things that cost money that need to happen in order for the apartment syndication to be set up. And the threshold at which the that starts to make sense is a couple million dollars. And you can go either way a little bit. It's not like a hard and fast rule, but you, I think most syndications that are out there, they're going to be at least a couple million dollars because of that fixed setup cost of the syndication. As a passive investor though, I think like any deal where you have a partner who you know and trust and who and for which you have a good sense of the numbers and are comfortable with the returns. I think you can be a passive investor or like a joint venture person in a more passive way on any size deal. But for the syndication set up specifically, it would be a couple million dollars. Got it. All right. So at this point, that is the end of the questions that I had from our network that weren't able to attend. I don't see any questions in the chat, but at this point, if anybody has any questions, please just take yourself off mute and chime in. Otherwise, we'll hang out for a few minutes. If anybody just wants to talk, I'll, I will. Let's see. So we do have a question. Who is the general partner for your fund? And how many, does that mean LPs do we have? I think, yeah. So yeah, we'll just go with that. Yeah, I can take that one, John. Sure. So for the fund, this is getting in the weeds a little bit, but we can explain how it works. The, the fund itself is typically an LP on on commercial deals where there is a separate operator who serves as the GP, who serves as the GP. The GP type role, just to try to answer your question as best as, as possible, the GP, like the active person managing the fund would be John and I, we're, we're the managing directors of the fund. And we're the ones who are validating the potential deals that we could bring into the fund uh, to connect with our passive investors. And we're the one ensuring the operations of the fund run smoothly and legally. As far as how many LPs do we have, the LP, what I'll expl- the way I'll explain that is, are some of the requirements for LPs to enter into the fund, which is that these need to be accredited investors. In general, that means $1 million net worth or 200K annual income for the past couple of years. And there's an entry minimum for the LPs, which is $50,000, which can be split across several different asset types within the fund. Those are some of the minimum requirements for LPs on the fund. And yeah, I'll leave it at that for now. Got it. And then, yeah, there was another part of, do you have any metrics like MOM or ROI? So part of that is what a lot of general partners in the syndication space are moving towards these days is they are offering incentivized shares, incentivized returns if an investor brings X amount of money to a deal, say like 500K or a million. And through the fund, we can pool money together and then invest as a large LP then we can get a better return for everybody who's involved within our fund. So that's going to look different in every deal. So it's not, it's different from other funds. Ours is a customizable fund. Daniel touched on it earlier. We are, it's a deal on a deal by deal basis. So we're not raising money ahead of time and giving a fixed return, but we will go, we'll, we vet out the sponsors of these deals, we build relationships with them. And then once they've met our criteria, then we would start receiving deals from them. And then once we like the deal, we would pass it through to our network of investors. So let's see, hope that- And it's just one, just to add on what you shared there, John, is one thing that I like about our fund model is that the traditional, like the conventional fund it just has like fun level metrics where we can just see is the fund up or down or what's the return on the overall fund. But because of the customizable nature and of the fund that we've put together, you get actual, you actually get deal level transparency. 
And so if you've invested in an apartment building and then some commercial debt, and then maybe something like a short-term rental, well, you can actually see, you can see your overall performance of the fund, but then you can also understand, hey, how much, what am I getting from my apartment building? What am I getting from my commercial debt? And I think that's really important because if every investor is going to have a little bit of a different mix and their metrics are going to look a little bit different, they're going to want to understand what, you know, where their returns are coming from. No, let's see. So Austin had a question. Interested to hear about where most of the LPs come from. Do we find most success from hosting these online events, social media, or personal network? All over the place. So there is network has been where we've gotten our start. And now we do host in-person events and yeah, online events. We have a podcast. So it's a mishmash of all of our different platforms that we have. Not It's not really a one size fits all. Just putting our stuff out there. And we try to build relationships with folks. We try to vet who would be investing with us because it is, it's not that you want to make sure that you're in the right, that it's the right setup for all of us. Passively investing is not right for everybody. Try to put it out there. Try to let people understand that if you're someone like we discussed earlier in this deal, you want to have that control over your deal, then this isn't the right, this isn't the right scenario for you. There's a number of things that go into it, but yeah, we try to, we build the relationship with the general partners and we build the relationship with the passive investors. And that can come from any number of different areas. Hope that helped. And if you have anything on that, Daniel. Yeah, I have a, the- a thesis, which is that as you're, when you're smaller, the the importance is on, there, there's a stronger importance on having a really close relation or having a strong relationship and building like a certain like vibe around like the handshaking kind of thing is really useful at the early stages. And then as you scale up, it's more about reaching as many, you've established that community or you've established that brand. And as you scale up, it's more important just to let as many people know about it as possible. So I think like it's a mix of both, but I think we, Sean, you and I, we have a little bit of a plan for how we plan, expect to scale that and both sides are important. Got it. Then next question, who is the custodian for the fund? So Daniel and I are the managing directors and outside of our real estate fund, not super familiar with uh, the way other like different hedge funds and the kind of lingo for that kind of stuff. So I'm not sure if I'm answering the question properly or if Daniel, if you have more information on that. Yeah. So we, yeah, like John said, we're the managing directors, but we work with like a legal team and several banks to make sure that everything is set up accordingly and being done the right way. So we have a system of subject matter experts in all those right areas to, to make sure that the fund is operating smoothly. And you're welcome. And let's see. So are there specific geographical areas that the fund is focusing on or are deals evaluated on a case-by-case basis? So I'll start this one out. So our approach is less on, sure, yeah, we have markets that we like more than others and we have asset classes that we like more than others. But I love the phrase, bet the jockey, not the horse. So our approach is building relationships with best in class operators who are putting together great deals, who have strong track records, who we've gotten together with and shaken hands and gotten a feel for them. And then once we have that relationship built, then we start looking at their deals that they're putting out. And that's what we spent basically the past year plus doing is traveling around and masterminds, virtual events getting to in-person events, building relationships with these operators who are, who do happen to be in great markets, Dallas, Jacksonville, Kansas City, guys who are putting together great deals and have a strong track record. So we're more on, uh, our thesis is more focused on partnering with strong operators than say the strong markets, but the market definitely is taken into consideration. And if Daniel, if you have anything else to add on that. Yeah, partners and outcome-based, really outcome-based approach, meaning if there's a deal, small town Midwest that's going to, that, that, that has a great partner behind it and has a great opportunity, then we might consider it, even though it's not like the hottest market. But like John said, we understand like the areas that we like best and start there, but it is case by case in the sense that we want to build a fund that is goal, has assets that achieve several different goals. And so we have that, take that into consideration as well. Absolutely. And If anybody is interested in learning more about what we're doing with this thing, I'm dropping a link in the chat right now. What this will take you to, it'll take you to a landing page and then we would deliver. We have, we have a, it's 
basically just a PowerPoint presentation that we put in the PDF format that goes into a little more detail about Passively Invest. We would love to connect with any of you guys if you have questions. Passive investing might not be your thing, but we're both passionate about helping people get the light bulb turned on and get started in real estate investing. So happy to help either way. We will be putting on more events. And if you guys, Alistair, you said you were up in San Francisco and Austin, if you happen to be up in the area as well, we're hosting our in-person event on Tuesday. We'd love to see you there. Great. So let's see. Awesome. Yeah. Our, I'll drop our website in the chat as well. So if you want to check us out, reach out, get in touch with us, shoot us an email or something. All of our contact information is on the website. So thank you guys for joining us. That's all we've got, unless you got any more questions. I'm going to take the opportunity just because it's four of us. Yeah, so man. I can ask a Let's question. So I'm making the transition into multifamily. We have single families and duplexes out of state and a couple here in the East Bay. And I'm the type of ready, fire, aim. All right, so I'm going and then I'm cleaning up the mess along the way. And so I jumped in into a general partnership. And so this was really helpful. My question is, obviously, you guys have worked together for a little while. What are what are red flags or what are key things that you're looking for in finding the right people to work with? I can start there. I think there's been a situation in my past. I don't want to go into too much detail about it because it is an active deal, but it's not that the deal is not performing well, but it's more so that it's not what I had hoped it would be as far as the way that people are communicating or the way that people out are performing their work. And this was because I based my, I, I didn't get a feel for these people myself. I trusted somebody else's knowledge who I had a good relationship and I do trust this person, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't still make sure your gut feeling is telling you that it's a good idea. So for me, we've touched on it a little bit, but it's all about the relationship and it's all about doing your homework on these people and not just taking it. Hey, this person who I trust says this person's good. Like when it comes to partnering up with another general partner, or even if you're a limited partner looking to invest with somebody, the same situation applies. Like you have to feel good about it going in and just do as much homework as you can on the people you're going to be working with. Yep. You know, fire fast, hire slow, I think is what they say. And so if you're looking for general partners, the, high, the higher slow part is a good idea. Ready and fire, I'm with you. When I was talking earlier about being an optimist and figuring things out along the way, like I totally agree. That's how I am too. But I think like from our experience so far, if it's the, if the partnership you're talking about is like something like a, a GP and finding other good G GPs, then like, yeah, maybe take a beat <laughs> to make sure that like you really know what that person is about and how they work because they might have, everyone kind of throws around impressive numbers and everyone sounds successful, but once you get under the hood or get in a deal with somebody, then you fi find out their working style and you figure out if like you guys like vibe. I don't know if that's what you're thinking about, but that's a couple of thoughts for me. No, that helps a lot. Thanks guys. Yeah. yeah, what else you got, Austin? In that case, I'll just, just start firing some stuff off. Go for uh, it, I'm man. interested. I know you said you bet on the jockey, not the horse, but are you taking into account when you're looking at specific mark? Obviously, favor some, but are you staying away from certain states? Uh, other than California? No, but, look, I have this conversation quite a bit about California. I like, I like are obviously making... California. Okay, great. Yeah, like, yeah. People, like I was just going to say, people are obviously making money here. It's just that, yeah. like, where's your syndication that you have? So the property is in Ohio. Okay. Got it. Yeah. yeah. So as far as the syndication model, I think it's, I don't know, with, with the cash on cash returns being what they are here, it's difficult to do that. And I'm not saying I wouldn't take, jump on an opportunity if somebody had already done the legwork and made it made sense to me in California. But yeah, I try to, the big markets, like they're no secret, like we love Dallas, Phoenix. There's a couple other ones that are maybe not as big to some, but like Kansas City is a very safe, stable market. Yeah, like, I like that Kansas market. City. Yeah. So yeah, it's no secret. We don't have any. Uh, don't have any obvious markets that I am avoiding other than California currently. But maybe I should change. Maybe I should learn. It's my backyard. It's where I live. So I think it's just like the value add is hard to pull off in California. Just right. It's an economics thing. But if you I don't know. I don't know the model behind your stuff in the East Bay. If you're a GP and you want LPs involved, like there's all sorts of LPs and not everybody wants like the highest return, 
right? And so if there's other models that are not value add, they totally work in California. I think that my one go my one piece of advice about like other markets is um, like I at first I was like I wanted to like find like my market. It's like you, you like find your cool like indie band or whatever. That's what doesn't really exist. So like, if you're feeling the same way, just for, my advice would be like forget it because primary, secondary, tertiary markets are like they're big and thriving for a reason, and that's that those are a good place to start. Yeah, I'm with you. I don't have one market. We have stuff in five different states. So I'm just, wherever the economics makes sense and we can build a team, let's go there. (laughs) I have one more question, just because this is 90% of our portfolio is based on creative financing. And that's what I, that's what I know. I'd say that's my niche. Are you guys seeing opportunities now in multifamily with maybe newer investors who got into it thinking they were going to do something big and maybe not knowing how to operate it? and just need to get out from under something? Are you seeing opportunities for any kind of seller financing or even loan assumptions or leases with options to purchase, like anything like that, or more so than in the past? Yeah, you mentioned loan assumptions. That's the one that comes to mind as like creative financing because there's a lot of operators out there who maybe they're not necessarily new, but for whatever reason, they're either not running their business or they want to get out for whatever. There are folks selling who, and because of where the rates have gone over the last six months or a year, loan assumptions are like an awesome opportunity. And so as far as getting creative, that's one thing that we're seeing a lot of these days. Yeah, I would second that. I'd say the, the seller financing, that's the the unicorn that everybody is after, I think, you can if you can find that. But the best opportunities right now are the folks who are finding the assumable loans. And that's where I think the real money is going to be made over the next year plus. Yeah. And I think the longer that the rates stay up, like a lot of the big deals, there's like a Fannie or Freddie debt for like the purchase of the property, like government backed, like long-term fixed rate loans. But then a lot of these deals, because they're typically value add, they also require some like supplemental financing that isn't fixed rate. And whatever that is, that th- those rates are variable. So the longer that rates stay high, there's going to be, there's going to be, it's going to be more likely or more extended opportunity for those deals structured that way to not work anymore, right? Because you got to, basically they're having a cash flow problem. So they're going to want to sell for that reason. So anyways, maybe not today, but like the longer the rates are up, that's going to continue to be an issue because there's often that fear of the rate financing to like finance capital improvements or something like that. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Last question I have is, do you guys ever do anything out this way towards Solano County, towards Sacramento, any kind of events? Are you guys centrally located in the city or on the peninsula? Where do you you guys usually go? I'm I'm in San Francisco proper. And so I think when we do stuff in the Bay Area, it's probably going to be around here. But there's a lot of good meetups down here. I don't know about Sacramento, but there's a few good real estate related things going on down here. So maybe one one day you can make the trip. <laughs> yeah, I, I only ask because I host events throughout the Bay. And so I do them in San Jose. Last May, we did one in the city in the Mission. I do them up in SAC. And so if there's ever an opportunity to bring you guys out, and we have a couple of big multifamily guys that come through. Yep. Uh, and I just like being the connector of all people. I just throw the party and let everyone else enjoy it. I love it. So I'd love to just stay connected with you guys and see if we can get you guys out there and share what you guys are doing. Yeah, awesome. absolutely. Yeah, that'd be great, man. Um. Would love to do that. And if you ever find yourself down on the central coast, that's where I'm located. It's a little drive. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> totally. Cool. I think I think that was a good sesh. So I'm going to go ahead and hit stop. So thank you guys for joining and look forward to chatting next time. Hope to see you in person sometime soon. Awesome. Alrighty. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Right. Yeah. Stay in touch, Austin. We'll- awesome. We'll yep. Thank you for listening to Freedom Investor Radio. If you like what you heard, Make sure to rate, review, subscribe, and share with a friend. Thanks again for listening.